Uh, so let us uh, go through this uh, paper, this year's uh, ethics paper. So if you look at this question paper, uh, uh, what are the observations uh, you can make uh, of this year's uh, ethics paper? First and foremost, uh, in uh, section A, questions are repeated. You can see repeat of questions from uh, previous years in section A. Some other questions are completely repeated, exactly the same. Second uh, observation you can make is that about this year's paper, you require in-depth knowledge of uh, public administration to answer uh, case studies. To answer all the case studies, you require uh, in-depth knowledge of uh, public administration to answer uh, these uh, case studies. Third uh, observation that we can make here is that uh, it is not uh, emphasizing too much on uh, philosophers. There is not much of emphasis on philosophers. So you don't have to unnecessarily focus uh, on reading uh, hundreds of philosophers. And the fourth observation that we can make uh, is uh, you require two important uh, things, two essential things. First one is, uh, second you see report on ethics and governance. Second one is, uh, second you see report on civil services. Almost all the questions were picked up only from these reports, these two important reports. And uh, the last uh, observation we can make uh, of this year's paper is, uh, you know, what is required is a simple conceptual clarity. And it does not require uh, any extensive reading. I dare say that uh, this ethics paper does not require more than uh, one week uh, to 10 days of preparation. In your entire mains preparation, it does not require more than one week to 10 days of a preparation. So these are all the observations that we can make uh, looking at this year's paper. Let us go into the questions. As all of you know, you know, you have uh, two sections. One is section A, which uh, tests your uh, conceptual clarity. Section B case studies, uh, which uh, tests your uh, application abilities, whether you can put your uh, concept into uh, the application in real life, especially in civil services. These two are the things which UPSC is looking from you. So let us look at uh, the questions. What are the basic principles of uh, public life? Illustrate uh, any three principles with suitable examples. So if you look at this question, uh, first of all, what uh, you should know what is public life. And what are those basic principles? How do we start your answer? We say that uh, human beings are social animals. We are social animals. We are dependent on others for our survival. It is the ethics, these are basic principles of ethics uh, that will teach uh, us about how to you know, behave with others, that teach us about uh, how to communicate with others, our relationship with others. And that is what is called public life. You know, our relationship with others in the society. We have our own private life, individual life. Whatever we do in our private life, you know, you can do whatever you want. You know, there is no limit. But when it comes to, you know, public life, in our dealings with others, there are certain principles which you follow. So if you look at it, what are those principles? You know, this is what uh, part of the syllabus also we can see. You know, Basically, we talk about moral values. What are the moral values? You know, the second topic of your syllabus, you know, it talks about, uh, you know, attitude and uh, behavior and values. In the topic, you have uh, moral values. These moral values are basically the principles of, uh, you know, public life. What are the important uh, principles? You know, you can talk about so many of them. First one is, you know, you can say reverence that is respecting others. In our public life, we should always 
make sure that we respect others irrespective of uh, their position caste religion gender so on and so forth this is important for a society like india which is a uh, feudal which is hierarchical in nature we must have respect for others in india we can see that in our societies only those people who have money power and position are the ones who command respect poor people never command any respect from others so the most important principle is uh, this reverence respect for others second you can talk about uh, fidelity in relationships fidelity f i d e l i t y fidelity in relationships that is what we call a uh, you know, trustworthiness in relationships trustworthiness this is what always say we are human beings as human beings we are social animals and as social animals uh, you know we always depend on others for our survival human relationships are always uh, we call them as reciprocal in nature we have to give something to others we will take something from others as human beings we cannot live all alone so the entire society the survival of society depends on this trust factor one of the important principle that should guide our public life is you know fidelity we must uh, create trust among the people you know the basic problem with indian society at this point of time is trust deficit why because of uh, increasing selfishness uh, on the part of the people in the society in the name of uh, you know promoting their self interest they do not mind uh, you know deceiving others manipulating others cheating others that is the reason why this is uh, another important principle that we must uh, follow in our public life next uh, you know another important principle that we should also think about is selflessness we can be selfless you know as again as i said uh, you know we should also always help others without expecting anything in return from them why because as i said again reciprocal human relationships are reciprocal in nature for example you are, you are walking on a street and you have seen a person injured you know through because of accident you know what you must do you know you must be able to take that person to the hospital and ensure better treatment for him because tomorrow if you are in that position you have to expect the same thing from others that is what mahatma gandhi always said he said that always do uh, those things to others which you will be doing uh, to yourself that is what to do unto the, those things to others which you will be doing for yourself which you are expecting from others also this is another important principle you know you should always help the people who are in need because tomorrow when the same need arises for you you can expect the same thing from others also you can talk about so many other things you know you can talk about so many other uh, the principles you can talk about uh, you know honesty you can talk about uh, you know empathy you know uh, you can talk about uh, you know love and affection you can talk about all of them but uh, you know from the examination point of view you have to talk about the three most, three most important uh, principles of public life why because as i said uh, you know you start our answer by saying that uh, human beings are social animals and they depend on others for their survival this is what ethics will be teaching us ethics is all about others next what do you understand by the term public servant reflect on the expected role of public servant so this public servant you know again i just said that these are the things which require a you know, theoretical knowledge of a public administration who is a public servant who is a public servant in broader terms how do we define a public servant any person who works for the welfare of the society you know who has been authorized by the government to work for the welfare of society public servant who has been authorized by the government very simple definition and you uh, know if you look at uh, from the government point of view ipc indian penal code uh, defined this term public servant who are they basically you can include army you know they are uh, maintaining borders they are ensuring uh, you know you know sovereignty of the nation you can include uh, you know civil servants civil servants our civil servants you can include uh, you know banking sector professionals you know you can include banking sector professionals you can include police law and order you can include police 
and you can include uh, these uh, employees of uh, public sector enterprises. All of them are called public servants. Civil servants are different from public servants. That is what you must remember. Civil servants are only, you know, we are talking about, uh, you know, those who are engaged in uh, uh, performing uh, these developmental and welfare functions of the government. So that is the reason why civil servants are different from public servant. In public servant category, we can include all of them. You know, all those people who are recognized by the government, who are who have been authorized by the government to serve the society, people. That is what is called a public servant. And uh, you know, uh, reflect on the expected role of the public servant. What are they are expected to do? What they are expected to do? As I said, every in a segment of this public servant are expected to perform different functions. In general, what are they expected to perform? The same functions which we talked about the role of the state. They are expected to maintain law and order. You know, they are expected to maintain law and order. They are expected to generate revenues for the government. Income tax officers, customs officers, collection of revenue for the government. They are expected to implement uh, developmental and welfare schemes. They are expected to implement developmental and welfare schemes. Next, uh, they are expected to run public sector enterprises, running of public sector enterprises. Next, they are uh, expected to change, influence public opinion in favor of uh, government so that you know developmental welfare schemes can be successful they are expected to ensure active participation of citizens in development administration active participation of citizens in development administration these are all the functions to be performed by public servants in fact here you can include judiciary also you can include judiciary also. So this is what we say about the role of the public servants. They are expected to perform all these functions. The challenge is in writing all of them in the very limited time that you have in the main examination. Especially in the ethics paper, the basic problem that you encounter is in completing the question paper. You can complete the question paper only when you have a prior knowledge of all these things very very important next uh, effective utilization of uh, public funds is uh, crucial to meet developmental goals critically examine the reasons for underutilization and uh, misutilization of public funds and their implication so the question says that uh, effective utilization of uh, public funds is uh, necessary to meet uh, developmental goals that is what again we say development administration what does development administration involve? Development administration involve in the first formulating programs and projects. Second, allocating finances. Allocating finances. Third, implementation of programs and projects. And fourth, evaluation of performance. evaluation of performance. This is what we say. As I keep on saying, uh, you require a good theoretical knowledge of public administration to answer all the questions. Development administration involves all these things. Now coming back here, the most important thing here is uh, in, uh, this one, in, uh, effective utilization of uh, funds, implementation of programs. In, uh, we should ensure that outlays are transformed into outcomes. We must ensure that outlays are transformed into outcomes. And we say that in India, development administration is a failure because of high levels of corruption. We say that development administration is a failure because of high levels of corruption. The problems are related to utilization of funds. They are related to misallocation of funds. They are related to uh, misuse of funds. 
Now the question says, critically re examine the reasons for underutilization and misutilization of funds and their impl implication. You can see the question, the question has asked so many things and again the challenge is to write, to answer each and every part of the question. Two things they have asked. One is under utilization of funds. Second one is misutilization of funds. Both of them are different. That is what we must remember. Under utilization is means uh, different from misutilization. Give the example. In the year 2016, Smart Cities program, the government allocated 8,000 crores. But the amount of money spent by the state governments was only 167 crores. The budget allocation was 8,000 crores. But the amount of money spent was only 167 crores. This is what is called underutilization of funds. Now, the question here is why there is underutilization of funds? Why there is underutilization of funds? Why? Because you know, the government you know, has the tendency to start mega developmental schemes. It has a tendency to start mega developmental schemes without creating proper structures to implement them. Without creating proper administrative structures to implement them. That is most important reason for underutilization of schemes. And the curious case here is that when it comes to development administration in India, the basic problem is not about availability of funds. The basic problem is always about underutilization of funds. You take any of the schemes, you take any of the schemes, it is all about uh, underutilization of funds. Why? Because the government, successive governments never really bother to create proper administrative structures, proper political uh, systems, proper, uh, 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 proper uh, rules and regulations to ensure effective utilization of funds. Another important reason why there is misutilization or underutilization of funds is, you know, the lack of awareness among the citizens about these programs. Lack of awareness among the citizens about these programs. Simply don't, they don't know what are the programs implemented by the government, how much amount of money allocated by the government and who are the beneficiaries. And, uh, you know, this results in what you call misutilization of funds. Why there is misutilization of funds? You know, what are the reasons why we have misutilization of funds? First one is, you know, we don't have any outcome budgets. We don't have any outcome budgets, wherein the expenditure is not linked to outcomes. Second, high levels of secrecy in implementation of developmental programs. High levels of secrecy. The beneficiaries who are supposed to benefit don't know what are the benefits they are supposed to get. Give example here again. You know, third one is, as I said, the lack of awareness among the people, among the beneficiaries, lack of awareness uh, among the beneficiaries about these schemes. Give the example, on an average, any Indian village, any average Indian village is expected to get the benefits of 350 schemes, central and state government schemes. How many of those villages know about all the 350 schemes? That is what another reason why there is misallocation. Mis Fourth, complete absence of accountability mechanisms. Bureaucracy in India is morally responsible but not legally accountable. They are only morally responsible but not legally accountable to realize outcomes. That is what another reason why we have so much of a, you know, misutilization of funds, lot of corruption. And after writing all these things, you have to come out with solutions. The solutions is very simple. The government must ensure good governance in implementation of developmental and welfare schemes. What is this good governance? Participation, transparency, accountability, decentralization. All these things should be there in implementation. Next. Non-performance of duty by a public servant is a form of corruption. Do you agree with this view? Justify your answer. I remember, you know, when we discussed corruption in our classes also, I said that corruption is not only about 
taking bribes it is also about not performing your duties not performing your duties in india again you know if you look at all the questions all of them are interrelated the almost answer will be the similar answer you will be writing if not exactly the same answer for all these questions okay the basic reason why as we keep on saying the you know, welfare administration india is a failure why it is a failure because as we have said the you know, our bureaucracy never takes their job seriously neither seriously nor sincerely corruption you know the general view general opinion about corruption is that taking bribes is called corruption this is only one form of corruption this is only one form of corruption taking bribes or indulging in nepotism or favoritism this is only one form of corruption the most important you know form of corruption is non performance non performance of duty you know that is where the problem with a country like india is why this non performance that is what you have to address the question you know issue why there is non performance on the part of a public servants in india and what should be done why our you know public servants are under performing they never perform to their maximum possible extent they never think about expanding their capabilities improving their skills why that is what the question two important reasons here two important reasons why first one is their performance in terms of implementing developmental and welfare schemes is not a factor that will influence their career advancement that is their promotions transfers suspensions postings do not depend on their performance as i keep on saying the question paper looks uh, simple but it requires a lot of precision a lot of uh, what you call a specific knowledge of a public administration it requires and that is the reason why people normally don't get marks in ethics paper why because they think that ethics is about uh, uh, the hundreds of philosophers they read 100 philosophers they become 101 philosopher then they start thinking what is upsc what is exam life is full of myth okay so that is where the problem that is where the problem and as i said you know they read hundreds of pages you know of all these philosophers right from a you know, greek philosopher aristotle to india's present number one philosopher rahul gandhi <laughs> who said that poverty is a, a state of mind okay so that is where the problem is you know when upsc included this paper in our syllabus their objective is not to test whether you have the knowledge of all these philosophers or not their objective is to see whether you can understand their philosophies and most importantly use them in civil services that is what the upsc is testing that is the reason why if you look at in the last few years all the questions are tended to be more practical aspects of public administration you are going to be administrator you are not going to be physicist or a mathematician you are going to be ias officer you should know about practical aspects of administration that is what upsc is testing and this is the reason why this year if you look at entire ethics paper as well as a political governance paper it is full of technical aspects of public administration only so coming back here the you know, first reason is why you know, because they are uh, their career advancement is not dependent on their performance second reason why they are underperforming because in a parliamentary democracy bureaucracy is not directly accountable to people they are not directly accountable to people for their performance there is no accountability towards the citizens for their performance and what do we say they are only morally responsible they are only morally responsible 
but not legally accountable. That results in their underperformance. The question they will be asking, civil servants in India, the question they will be asking is, why should we perform? UPSC is asking, they are underperforming. The question they will ask is, why should we perform? Why should they perform? Because their promotions do not depend on their performance. Because they are not accountable to the people. Why should they perform? What is the incentive? What is the motivation for them to perform? That is the reason why underperformance is the norm. Performance is the exception of public servants in India. Why? Because we continued with the same colonial structures wherein the British has made sure that civil servants are accountable to their higher levels in the hierarchy. And they made sure that civil servants are ne never made accountable to the people. That is what the solution you have to write towards the end. You know, you have to implement uh, governance reforms wherein a uh, civil servant should be made accountable to the people for their performance. How? Through Syrian charters, through RTI, through social audits. And then change uh, you know, this, uh, in, implement civil services reforms in terms of uh, you know, promotions, transfers and uh, everything else. Make it mandatory that uh, their performance in their particular position should be the basis of their promotions, transfers and postings. So that, uh, you know, underperformance can become the exception and performance the norm. Next question. What is meant by the term constitutional morality? How does one uphold constitutional morality? In, uh, if you happen to read newspapers in the last one year or so, this uh, term constitutional morality has been used. It has been used by, you know, our judiciary more often than not. So, what is this constitutional morality? Before that, you know, we should know what is constitution and what is morality separately, then we can combine both of them. If you look at that is what, again, uh, your knowledge of ethics should come into help here, in a theoretical knowledge of ethics. We say that there are so many sources of ethics. There are so many sources of ethics in any society. What are the important sources of ethics that we study? What are the sources of ethics? First, we say God and religion. In any society, it is the God and religion that, uh, you know, the most important source of ethics. Then we say that in democratic societies, it is the government that provides ethical guidance to the people. Then we talk about so many other things. But from our uh, uh, question point of view, this is very important. So, it is the government that decides what is good and what is bad for the people. In a democratic polity, the most important source of ethics is the, the government. And that is the reason why, you know, you know, we say that uh, legality and morality. These are the terms which we use, you know, while talking about, uh, you know, constitutional ethics. So, what is this constitution? The constitution is a legal document. It is a legal document that defines the relationship between the state and the citizens. It is a legal document that defines the relationship between the state and citizens. It is also a legal document that defines the powers of the different organs of the state. You know, when we discuss uh, political governance paper day after tomorrow, I will be repeating all these things because uh, half the questions in political governance are, paper are on the basis of this only. Here you have to remember our important philosopher. Era Thomas Hobbes, a British philosopher. Thomas Hobbes. What did he say? He said that uh, era in uh, under normal circumstances, it is the morality that should define legality. It is the morality that should define legality. That means, era what is uh, right and wrong, what is right and wrong morally should become what is legal and illegal. What is right and wrong should define what is legal and what is illegal. Legal and what is illegal. It is the morals that should be the basis of legality. But Hobbes, he said that, you know, when the state becomes too powerful, 
it is the legality that defines morality in most of the societies it is the legality that defines morality what do you mean by that you know when the constitution says that something is legal it automatically becomes moral also for example in our constitution you know in a in our you know uh, uh, rules and regulations capital punishment is legal so we think that it is also moral and uh, similarly you know we you can give the other example you know uh, if you say that uh, betting is illegal it becomes immoral in uh, uh, countries like uk usa betting is legal it also becomes moral so this legal document constitution you know in a constitution provides all the rules regulations and uh, provisions regarding how the country should function but this legal document should always be functioning on the basis of what is called morality this legal document functioning should always be on the basis of what is called morality you know as i said that the laws according to thomas hobbes they can be either legal or they can they can be moral or they can be immoral or they can be amoral also the laws rules and regulations formulated by the government or they can be moral sometimes they can be immoral sometimes they are amoral also can you name those laws which are immoral here you know, for example you know prohibition is there in one state it is illegal and immoral it is not there in other states it becomes legal and moral yes you know in uh, bihar i think there is a prohibition prohibition now in gujarat it has been there for a long period of time in those states if you are drinking it is illegal and immoral in other states come out of the borders if you are drinking it is legal as well as moral so that is what you know sometimes uh, you know, there is so much of confusion regarding uh, this constitution laws rules and regulations that is when you take the help of morality to interpret legality that is what we call constitutional morality constitutional morality this is the term that has been used by our judiciary in recent times you know to expand the scope of judicial review you know there are so many judgments which are based on what is called the concept of constitutional morality which have become the basis of supreme court judgments for example supreme court judgment in the case of shabarimala when supreme court has said that women should be allowed to enter into the temple it is based on what you call constitutional morality you know if you look at uh, the constitution fundamental rights either you know, right to equality people should not be discriminated on the basis of their gender but whereas in this uh, in a temple shabarimala you know the discrimination takes place on the basis of gender so supreme court interpreted the constitution from a moral basis and has said that this uh, cultural practice either you know, in you know, a of shabarimala temple management is wrong similarly supreme court judgment in you uh, know uh those uh, surrogacy you know supreme court judgment in suicide then a uh, supreme court judgment in uh, uh this uh, uh what is that uh, rule uh, say 317 377 only or where a supreme court has said that uh, in a uh, yes a sexual orientation uh, in a uh, is not a crime these are all based on what, what on based on what is called constitutional morality they are all based on constitutional morality supreme court nowadays is going to is willing to go beyond established you know rules and regulations in the constitution and interpret them on the basis of the higher you know principles of morality that is what we say and this is where again you talk about another important philosopher you know there is this philosopher called in you know, a thomas aquinas who said that uh, when there is a conflict between primary and secondary laws of nature we should always give importance to primary laws of nature that is the reason why supreme court is interpreting uh, all these uh, you know laws rules and regulations from uh, the point of view of primary laws of nature nature does not differentiate between man and woman that is the reason why supreme court has said that uh, you know when shabarimala temple management said that they would not allow women it is wrong whenever there is conflict you have to you take the help of philosophers when you are writing these kind of questions next 
examine the uh, ex explain the basic principles of Syrian Shatters movement and bring about its uh, importance. Exa uh, yes. Oh, okay, sorry. What is meant by a crisis of conscience? How does it manifest in public domain? The same question was asked three times in the last uh, seven years. Repeated. Of course, to maintain consistency, UPSC continued with spelling mistakes also. So, because the problem with the ethics paper is that uh, the syllabus is so less. You know, you have to ask the same kind of questions all the time. That's why I said that it does, not, it does not require more than one week or ten days of preparation. So, coming back here, what is a crisis of conscience? You know, this is what we say. What really differentiates human beings from animals is this conscience. You know, we have the ability to think. This ability to think helps us to differentiate between what is good and what is bad. It is ability to think uh, differentiates uh, the help us to differentiate between what is good and what is bad. It is our conscience. You know, in the earlier question, I said that uh, you know there are important sources of ethics. One of the important sources of ethics is human conscience. It is uh, our conscience that helps us to differentiate between what is good and what is bad. You know, it is our. You know, that is why we say that uh, we can deceive anyone else in the world. But when you stand in front of mirror and look at yourself into mirror and ask the question, what you have done is right or wrong? Can you deceive yourself? You cannot deceive yourself because you are conscious. And that is the reason why we say that, that is what we study in ethics paper. That is why we say that the moment we silence our conscience, the moment we kill, we kill our conscience, there is no difference between human beings and animals. That is the reason why we have so many crimes that are being committed in our society. Why? Because we behave like animals, you know, by silencing our conscience. You know, when you are cheating others, deceiving others, indulging in sexual exploitation, you know, killing others, causing injuries to others, this is when you kill your conscience. You behave like animals. Coming back here, you know, the question here is, uh, what is crisis of conscience? What is the crisis of conscience? What does it mean? It means that, you know, you are in a dilemma, you are in doubt regarding what you should do in a particular situation. You know, what you should do in a specific situation, a particular situation. Why? Because the problem with ethics is that, the problem with values is that they are not absolute. They are always relative. They are always relative. In a particular situation, there is nothing like uh, this is the concrete solution. For example, in a, in a, you are writing in the examination. In a, the examiner no, is not there in the room. And uh, your friend sitting next to you is willing to show his answer sheet so that he can write from his answer sheet. And uh, if you don't do it, you will fail. If you do it, it is morally and legally wrong. What you do? What will you do? That is what is called a crisis of conscience. Here there is no crisis here. We know. <laughs> we will know. We know what to do. Right? This is what is called a crisis of conscience. Whenever, you know, you, know, you always face this kind of ethical dilemmas. Similarly, you are a civil servant. You know, you know that the order given by your superior is morally and legally, ethically wrong. You know, if you don't implement it, he can suspend you. If you implement it, it is wrong. Crisis of conscience. What will you do under those circumstances? As we study all the time, you know, the problem is that there is a no absolute true or complete false. Everything is relative in this world. And that is where we find this kind of a crisis. Because you are always a torn between self-interest and societal welfare. You are always a, you know, in, a, in this conflict zone between what is good for you and what is good for us from the society point of view. Society point of view. And this is where you find the crisis. And 
how does it manifest in public domain as i said you know from the point of view of civil servants how does it manifest in a from the point of view of a civil servants and from the point of view of a, a society in general also as i said first one is a self interest versus a societal welfare second one is a in a in a interest of organization in a interest of organization versus that of people in general for example as a civil servant you know as a civil servant you know should you be working for the government or for the people should you be working for the government or for the people or third in you know, a short term benefit or versus long term you know cost for example constructing a dam might be useful for today but in tomorrow it can result in environmental degradation crisis of a conscience here you know, similarly honesty versus integrity should you be speak truth all the time or should you be looking at uh, protecting the interests of your organization here a district collector you know huge amount of corruption had taken place in uh, implementation of nrega should you be speaking truth and tell the public about what happened or should you be covering up the entire issue under the corporate in the name of a public interest these are all the crises that you always face and how to find solutions to this crisis of conscience how to find solution always think about the interests of the society we should always put the interests of society at large above the interests of ourselves as well as that of organization that is what ethics teaches next explain the basic principles of citizen charters movement and bring out its importance what are the basic principles of citizen charters again you know what are the basic principles why the citizen charters had come into existence so you start your answer with why do we need citizen charters you know what do we why do we need citizen charters as we always talk about this you know it is a representative democracy along with the colonial bureaucracy representative democracy along with the colonial bureaucracy had made sure that there is no participation of citizens in development process representative democracy and colonial bureaucracy made sure that there is no scope for citizen participation in development which resulted in failure of development administration in india lakhs of crores of rupees lakhs of crores of rupees of public money is spent on welfare administration without any accountability mechanisms is spent on welfare administration without any accountability mechanisms and uh, that is the reason why these citizen charters had come into existence they had come into existence to overcome the weaknesses of uh, development administration so what are the basic principles of uh, citizen charters <laughs> this background music is good you know you know so whenever uh, you find uh, in films climax uh, you know you need this kind of background music also okay so coming back here is it a ringtone <laughs> alarm okay very good you are revealing all your secrets in public domain this is the time you get up normally <laughs> so coming back here what are the basic principles first one is citizen participation in governance as i said in a representative democracy citizen participation in governance is restricted to voting in elections only for the next 5 years you have only electoral dictatorship second to transform our representative democracy to participative democracy to transform our representative democracy into participative democracy third again to transform moral responsibility of our bureaucracy into 
legal accountability to transform our moral responsibility of bureaucracy into legal accountability. Fourth, you know, to overcome weaknesses of a parliamentary democracy wherein bureaucracy is not directly accountable to the people. The objective is to make bureaucracy directly accountable to the people for their performance. To make bureaucracy directly accountable to the people for their performance. Fifth, you know, to improve quality of service delivery mechanisms. Quality of service delivery mechanisms. Sixth, to eliminate corruption. To eliminate corruption. These are all, you know, the basic principles of citizen charters. To eliminate corruption. These are the basic principles. And that is the reason why we say that Syrian charters are extremely important to realize the two important objectives. Syrian participation in governance and making bureaucracy accountable to the citizens for their performance. This is what you have to write. Next, there is a view that Official Secrets Act is an obstacle to the implementation of RTI. Do you agree with the view? Discuss. So, again, I will start my answer with uh, the objective of RTI. What is the objective of RTI? What is the spirit behind implementation of RTI? What is the spirit behind implementation of RTI? That means you don't know. Okay. What is the spirit? In democracy, people are sovereign. In democracy, people are sovereign. And people elected governments work for people. People elected governments work for people. They derive their power. People elected governments derive their power from the legitimacy you know, given by people through electoral process from legitimacy given by people through electoral process. And it is the people have the right, people have the right to know, they have the right to know what their governments are doing for their welfare. Here people are sovereign, governments are subordinate to the people. That is what democracy is all about. And this sovereignty can be exercised by the people only when they know how their governments are functioning in terms of policy formulation, implementation and everything else. In terms of allocation of resources, in terms of uh, implementation of welfare schemes. That is the spirit behind RTI. Now, once you look at, uh, know the spirit behind RTI, you can easily make out whether Official Secrets Act is an obstacle in uh, implementation of RTI or not. Again, here I will take the help of a second Yase report on RTI. What did second Yase say? When you are writing these kind of answers, it is always better to criticize you know, the government with the help of a second Yase. Second Yase has said that this Official Secrets Act is antithesis to RTI. Antithesis. Antithesis to RTI. And it has said that the objective of RTI is to ensure transparency. The objective of RTI is to ensure transparency. Whereas the objective of OSA is to ensure secrecy in administration. And it has said that both of them cannot go together. Can good and bad go together? Can good and bad go together? Can RTI and OSA go together? <coughs> Obviously not. It is against the letter and spirit of RTI. Why? Because as I said, this OSA was framed during the colonial times. During the colonial times, 
during the British times, 1923. It was framed during the colonial times, wherein the objective of uh, the British government was to hide information from the people. Why? Because the British government was highly exploitative in nature. If ordinary people come to know about uh, the exploitative nature of the British government, they can revolt against the government. That is the reason why British government had passed OSA. After independence, there is no place for OSA. Why? Because after independence, you know, we are ruling ourselves and we should know what the governments are doing. But there is some amount of information which has to be kept secretive. That information which is related to national security. That is the reason why you know, second year recommended that OSA should be removed and it should be replaced with the National Security Act as suggested by Shauri Committee. It should be replaced with National Security Act. All the information which is related to national security can be part of National Security Act. Rest of the information should be made public. Why? Because it is the transparency that can ensure accountability. That is what you have to write. It says that, do you agree with this view? Discuss. Yes, you agree because second ERC has suggested this. On the other hand, if you say that, you know, on the other hand, if you say that, yes, I agree, you know, the government is highly exploitative in nature, there should be revolution in the country, your answers will be sent to Naxal headquarters. <laughs> and you will be given posting by Indian Naxal service. So you have to be careful while writing answers. You cannot get emotional. You cannot say that since independence we have only highly exploitative governments. You cannot say that uh, the only thing that has changed after independence is a uh, white man's rule was replaced with brown man's rule. You cannot say that the only that is thing that is common to all our administration is exploitation. You cannot write all those things. Don't get emotional. That is the reason why write your answers in a very highly unemotional. That is the next question also, emotional intelligence. Right. Next. Uh, you know, what do you understand by probity in governance? Based on your understanding of the term, suggest measures for ensuring probity in government. Again, this question was repeated three times. This is the fourth time. If you have written mains previously, you can write that, please refer to my answer. <laughs> in 2015 mains paper. Give me marks also. God bless you. <laughs> you know, if they are repeating the question, what will you do? So, what is the answer to the question? Either, what is this probity in governance? As we discuss, we say that it is a multi-dimensional concept which involves structural as well as behavioral aspects. It is a multi-dimensional concept which involves structural and behavioral aspects of uh, civil servants. What are they? First one, you talk about uh, either discipline. Second, professionalism. Second one is a professionalism. Third one is efficiency. Fourth one is a empathy. Fifth one is a selflessness. Sixth one is a, is a conduct a rules and regulations. Civil service conduct rules and regulations. Seventh one is a selflessness. Did I mention that? Okay. Okay. Empathy, selfless. The seventh one is say, you can say, love and affection. Eighth one is honesty and integrity. Honesty and integrity. These are all part of what you call the term probity in governance, which talks about the structural as well as behavioral aspects. For example, you are a district collector. As a district collector, you are reaching a you are office at 1 p.m. The normal timings are morning 9 a.m. And you are asking about your office at 1 p.m. What about your subordinates? They will reach at 12.55. That is the reason why professionalism, discipline is a part of property. Recently, you have seen in newspapers, this uh, Madras uh, Chief Justice was transferred to Meghalaya court and she resigned also. What are the one of the reasons why the Supreme Court had transferred? 
because of probitine governance. She was unprofessional in her attitude. She would sit in high court only up to 12 noon. After that she would leave. Unprofessional attitude. Unprofessional attitude. Second, you know, she had you know, close connections with political families. You know, corruption, honesty. Close connections with political families. Third, she had you know, purchased properties and she has not informed the government. Conduct rules and regulations. That was the reason why she was transferred. Of course, you know, people in Tamil Nadu, they had become emotional and they started agitations. That is what you think about only people from Tamil Nadu. Okay. Okay. So that is what, that is the reason why probity in governance is very, very important. You must be professional in your attitude, highly disciplined, follow rules and regulations, be a role model for others, then behavioral aspects. You must have honesty, empathy, selflessness, love and uh, affection. You know, these are the things which are needed. How to ensure property in governance? That is what we say. We can ensure property in governance through code of conduct and code of ethics. The objective of code of conduct is to prevent negative behavior and the objective of code of ethics is to promote positive values. That is what you know about the probity in governance. Next come to the other questions. Emotional intelligence is the ability to make your emotions work for you instead of against you. Do you agree with the view? Discuss. This is what I remember again those who attend our ethics classes they know. Emotional intelligence should be all about your strengths not about your weaknesses. If you say that I am highly emotional person if you say that uh, you know I will uh, get angry all the time or I will cry always. That is your weakness. It cannot be your strength. You know, for example, you know, you are the chairman of ISRO and you start crying very loudly. <laughs> Stupid. You know. And uh, much uh, worse spectacle was the great Prime Minister consoling uh, him also. What nonsense is this? Right? You know, these are the things which you see in uh, kindergarten schools when the teacher consoles the uh, you know, baby student. You don't expect these kind of things from you know, the leaders of the country. Do you? Obviously not. You know, you know, these are the things I don't know whether to laugh or cry looking at uh, those kind of images. And then media reporting that uh, you know, our Prime Minister did a great job you know, by giving his shoulder for this person to cry. You know? This is utter stupid nonsense. You know? And then another thing is that uh, they are saying that it is, the experiment is 98 percent successful because uh, the land rover stopped 2 kilometers. <laughs> Either it is successful or not, accept it. That is what tomorrow we will be discussing uh, as part of uh, essays also. You must accept your weaknesses rather than, you know, you know uh, riding rough shoulder over uh, all of our weaknesses. You have to accept it. It is not successful means it is not. Because you conduct so many experiments, not everything has to be successful or not. It has to be, not everything has to be successful. You need that kind of uh, emotional intelligence to carry on and find out the weaknesses and rectify your mistakes rather than saying that it is 98 percent successful. It is like saying that uh, you are half pregnant. <laughs> there is a saying in English. <laughs> you know, either you are pregnant or not. You cannot be half pregnant. Similarly, you cannot say that it is 98 percent successful. You know? <laughs> you know, that is why, you know, sometimes when you look at our country, you don't know whether to laugh or cry. When the people in uh, positions of power, they do this kind of... Uh, Silly things which you do not expect even from kindergarten students also. Right, uh, coming back, uh, let us look at the question. Emotional intelligence is the ability to make your emotions work for you instead of uh, against you. As I said, uh, this is what, exactly this is what, you know, your emotions should be your strength, cannot be your 
weakness or weakness that is what the question says it should be your strength you know if you are a sensitive person you know that means uh, you feel uh, for uh, the sufferings of other people that should be your strength it cannot be your weakness other people cannot blackmail you you know saying that i am suffering so much you have to give my money to me that is uh, working against you similarly you get angry you have to use your anger as an emotion you know in a constructive manner when you see that uh, when you see that uh, your subordinates are not working properly you have to use your anger you know to tell what uh, you are feeling about them their performance you should always use your emotions in a positive and constructive manner they should be your strengths they cannot be your weakness you know as i said you know not all the time we can be successful in life in whatever we do that is where you must have that kind of perseverance ability to carry on you know we should always have what we call positive emotions you know if you are we cannot have negative emotion emotions can be either positive or negative for example being happy positive emotion you know being sad all the time negative you know being uh, having a peace of mind in you know, a positive emotions getting angry at all the time negative emotions so these emotions should be your strength but can never be your weakness that is what uh, the question says and uh, you know you must use your emotions uh, you know to work for you rather than working against you you know as i said if you start crying all the time you know you will not command respect from your subordinates yesterday i think uh, there was this article in indian express or uh, times of india wherein one of the uh, top most scientists from you uh, know uh, isro had questioned shivan he said that what kind of nonsense is this you know let us accept the fact that uh, it has not succeeded and find out the problems why find out the reasons why it has not succeeded rather than you know conducting meetings and uh, trying to cover up the whole issue that should not what a leader is expected to do a leader is the person who should be able to lead who should be able to take the responsibility who is willing to take the risks and who is willing to shield his subordinates that is what we call positive emotions on the other hand trying to find excuses and coming out with reasons why it has not worked the same is the problem with the political executive also what happens is that they never accept the reality they always come out with excuses for example when the, the auto sector in india auto industry is under recession our finance minister has said that millennials are not uh, you know using uh, are not willing to buy new cars you know they are using ola and uber that is the reason why we have a recession you know the prices of vegetables are coming down because everyone is eating from uh, swiggy and uh, you know zomato so you can come out with all these kind of excuses that is where your emotional intelligence you know it is all about accepting our mistakes and willing to rectify your mistakes and it is all about using our emotions in a constructive positive manner to develop ourselves and also to provide guidance to others they should not come in the way of your own development that is what the question is all about next what do each of the following quotations mean to you an unexamined life is not worth living socrates again uh, you can easily predict uh, all these you uh, know uh, uh, statements given by quotations given by upsc every year one quotation will be there from mahatma gandhi as i keep on saying all the time in our ethics classes gandhi has quotation for everything under the sun above the sun and including the sun so upsc will not be looking for quotations for the next 5000 years because gandhi has uh, more than 1 lakh quotations for everything so if at all you have to prepare for this you know go to internet and search for gandhi's quotations the second you know is always there in the first quotation only every year now look at the first one socrates an unexamined life is not worth living so what does it mean you know what do you mean by an unexamined life is not worth living what is the meaning i remember you know i think you have got also in the last year on our test series ethics also i gave the same quotation intelligent people think alike upsc and myself okay <laughs> okay coming back here you know what is what do you mean by that an an examined life is not worth living what do you mean by that without goals i 
unexamined means what? Unexamined means where you did not face any challenges or troubles or different kinds of situations. In a, in a life where you do not find challenges or troubles or different kind of situations. It is not worth living. It is not worth living. Why? Because growth and development depends directly on these things. As a person, our growth and development depends on how do we cope up with the challenges? How do we cope up with uh, you know, uh, new situations? How do we cope up with the troubles, problems in our life? Every moment of our life, we have to challenge ourselves. We have to take up new initiatives. We have to uh, you know, face new situations to see you know, how much improvement we have made you know, compared to the past. The only thing that we say that is constant in this world is change. And we must change ourselves to the changing circumstances. We must change for betterment. How can we change for better? Only when we face challenging circumstances. That is the reason why what we say is that, you know, again I will give you the example of civil servants in India. Why they are not efficient? Why they are not efficient? They don't face any professional challenges. Because they perform what is called routine, mundane tasks, which does not require any kind of creativity on their part. They do not want to take risks. It is as simple as that one. The first thing you talk to any civil servant is that, what are the rules and regulations? He will always go by rules and regulations. That is the reason why we say that civil service in India, you know, they are efficient but not effective. Operation is successful and patient is dead. That is what we say. Why? Because they don't want to take up challenges. They don't want to, you know, face new situations. You know, that is what, in general, about people also. You know, that is the reason why, you know, what is the reason why the, you know, the difference between the developing countries like America or, you know, developing countries like India. In India, people always prefer stability in everything that they do. You know, change is all not at all, you know, welcomed in our society. It is not at all welcomed. You know, we always prefer status quo. That is the reason why our life becomes, you know, completely sedentary. It becomes completely useless. That is what. You know, you should always take up new challenges. You should always aim for the sky. That is what they say. When you aim for the sky, at least you can reach the tree top. And what do we do? We always look for underground. Okay. That is what. Okay. You know, that is why we say that. As long as there is certainty, you know, regarding future, we will never develop. It is as simple as that one. That is the reason why civil servants in India are not efficient. Why? Because once you get into services for the next 35 years, you will be there in service. What is the reason why private sector is more efficient? There is so much of insecurity, uncertainty. They face challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. They come out with solutions. They come out with innovations. Sometimes they fail. Sometimes they succeed. But they will not stop you know, facing those challenges. That is what Socrates has said. An unexamined life is not worth living at all. Very, very important. You know, we must make ourselves flexible. You know, that is the reason why I just said that you know, once you know, they get into the recess, they become you know, what is called status quo, moribund. And uh, they become completely docile. They are not creative. They are not innovative. Why? Because they did no need for them. Because they don't have to improve their performance. Because they don't have to, you know, worry about their career progression. In the private sector, why they are efficient? Because every day they have to face challenges. The organization gives them challenges, saying that this is what you have to achieve. That is where you learn so many things also. Whether it is life or career or anything else. That is when only you can develop. You know, for example, if, you know, Siddharth, who was the prince, you know, he had the entire kingdom at his feet. He did not like it. He left it. He went into forest. He wanted to find out the essence of life. 
in the process he in the process he became gautam buddha that is what is challenging yourself either you know he wanted to challenge himself to find out about uh, what is the essence of life you know a mahatma gandhi he challenged himself you know to see whether he is a uh, you know uh, whether he is a uh, two important weapons truth and non violence can help him in uh, succeeding in life when he opted for non violence everyone made fun of him but he believed in this peace and non violence which ultimately led to india getting independence also he challenged himself that is where you know the life becomes much more worthwhile since independence you know we have seen in so many rich people so many since the beginning of civilization you take so many rulers are there you know so many mighty rulers are there why don't we talk about them we talk about only either a someone like gautam buddha or mahatma gandhi or mother teresa why because they challenged themselves they faced you know other situations and they proved themselves they put themselves to critical examination on a daily basis that is where they made their life also worth the living next a man is a but the product of his thoughts what he thinks he becomes this is what we say all the time in you know, a mahatma gandhi also say same thing again this is what immanuel kant one of the important philosophers also talked about he defined goodness in terms of good intentions either what really matters what is the barometer to you know evaluate this concept of goodness in terms of your intentions in terms of your thoughts this is what we study in deontological ethics you know people like immanuel kant and mahatma gandhi are the proponents of this you know ethics what do they say they say that you know if your thoughts are good you will select the right kind of instruments and the outcome of your actions will always be good outcome of your actions will be good everything depends on this that is the reason why immanuel kant he said that goodness is defined in terms of good will good will you know your thoughts good will so good intentions a man is but the product of his thoughts what he thinks he becomes if you think like jesus christ you will become jesus christ if you think like adolf hitler you will become adolf hitler it is as simple as that one if you think like gautam buddha you can become gautam buddha if you think like mother teresa you will become mother teresa it is as simple as that one he the what he thinks he becomes he the if you are thinking about power all the time you will become adolf hitler dictator if you think about appropriating more power unto yourself you will become hitler he will be responsible for in a world wars also and on the other hand if you as i said if you think like you know jesus christ or mahatma gandhi he will become like them that is what mahatma gandhi has said everything depends on our thought process in the beginning also as we have said the most important source of ethics is our conscience the our inner self that will help us to decide what is good and what is bad this is what mahatma gandhi has said as i said you know your actions as well as outcome of your actions depend on your thoughts give the example you know take the case of politicians there is huge amount of divergence between what they think what they say and what they do what you call it as intellectual dishonesty what is the reason why a country like india is underdeveloped why because you know as mahatma gandhi has talked about you know one of the seven sins politics without principles all the politicians have only one thing uh, that uh, they are concerned about how to reach positions of power and stay in those positions of power for a very long period of time they are not concerned about people they are only what you call power mongers 
That is the reason why Mahatma Gandhi has said that, uh, you know, we must clean our thought process. Uh, we met, must get rid of uh, negative intentions. We must get ri rid of uh, negative emotions. We must get rid of, uh, you know, bad thoughts. Then automatically, you will become a purified soul. What is called Mahatma. Mahatma means Mahan plus Atma, a noble soul, a purified soul. That is why this is very, very important. Next, where there is righteousness in the heart, there is beauty in the character. Where there is beauty in the character, there is harmony in the home. When there is harmony in the home, there is order in the nation. When there is order in the nation, there is peace in the world. The same thing. You can say that, please refer to my previous answer. Give me marks also. Because the, you have to write the same answer. You know, first of all, as we said, you know, this is what uh, Swami Vivekananda also has said. What did he say, Vivekananda? He said that, uh, I always prefer a person with a kind heart. You know, at any point of time, I always prefer a person with a kind heart than an intelligent mind or brain. Why? Because intelligence can be used either for good or bad. But who will tell you how to use your intelligence? Your heart. It is your heart. You know, when God has created human beings, you know, what did he do? When he created human beings, he had given us the power to think analyze and to take decisions. The difference between human beings and animals. He had given us the power to think, analyze and you know, take decisions. And mostly what we have done, we have used this power only to manipulate, exploit, cheat others. Why? Because we have forgotten another part of our body which he had given to us that is heart it is where our emotions reside here we have forgotten the fact that you know we have to you know we have to think from the core of our heart rather than mind that is where the problem if at all you know if we have told, we have to pray to God. The only prayer that we can have to God is, please change our hearts. Make them much more human. Fill our hearts with love and affection. Take away other negative emotions, jealousy, revenge, prejudices from our heart. Fill our heart with positive emotions. You know, let us feel empathy for those who are suffering. Let our heart beat for those people, uh, you know, who are uh, suffering. That is the only prayer we can make to God. Why? Because unfortunately in this world, we have so many intelligent people, but they don't have kind heart. You know, they use their intelligence to only exploit others, manipulate others, to realize their self, selfish interests. That is where, you know, this quotation can help us. If you have a good heart, automatically you become a good human being. You know, as I said, as we study, you know, those who have attended our ethics classes, this is what I said all the time. Goodness is the core of everything. If you are a good human being with a kind heart, he will be a good, uh, you know, citizen, good family man, good civil servant, good politician, good lawyer, good doctor. The basis of everything is goodness. And that is the reason why, if at all, when we pray to God, you know, change our hearts, do bypass surgery, and uh, give us some amount of love. You know, we are not that bad people. Only thing is that we have forgotten our basic emotions. In this uh, rat race for materialistic comforts, we have forgotten the fact that we are human beings also. That is where the problem. 
So this is what you have to write for these kind of questions. Next kind of questions. Next, come to the case studies. Again, uh, either, if you look at this case studies, this year UPSC has again completely changed the template of case studies. Again, uh, UPSC is looking from you a very good uh, theoretical and practical knowledge of public administration to answer case studies. You are heading the rescue operations in a rain affected area in a, which uh, by rain eff uh, area affected by severe natural calamity. Thousands of people are rendered homeless and deprived of food, drinking water and other basic amenities. Rescue work has been disrupted due to heavy rainfall and damaged uh, supply routes. The local people are seating, seating with, uh, not seating, seating with uh, anger against the delayed limited rescue operations. When your team reached the affected area, the people there heckled and even assailed some of the team members. One of your team members is even severely injured. Faced with this crisis, some team members plead with you to call off the operations, fearing threats to their life. In such trying circumstances, what will be your response? Examine the qualities of public servants which are required to manage the situation. And, uh, you know, incidentally, the same case study I have given uh, this year in our case studies. You know, I think you have got that... Uh, paper also, you can see that one, you know, 15th July, you can see, you are in charge of rescue operations in a severely flood heat area, thousands of people are stranded in deep waters in their homes without food and drinking water. Because of rough topography, heavy rainfall, the rescue operation is very slow. When you remove your standard people, they heckle and assail you. UPSC copied, uh, <laughs> not uh, line by line or word by word, alphabet by alphabet. Yeah. That is the problem. We don't have intellectual property rights. Right? But as I keep, you know, I always tell in my ethics classes also, it is very easy to predict ethics case studies. You know, that is the reason why when others say that they want to do 200, 300 case studies, I said that when UPC is asking only 6 case studies, do only 6 of them for practice. Because UPC will ask the same 6 only. Okay. You can see the exact, you know, even other case study, one more case study also, exactly the same case study. You know, because you know, because UPS and myself, both of us take from same sources. When we do it, it is called inspiration. When others do it, it is called copying. So, coming back here, you know, so what is the problem here? The problem here is that uh, regarding disaster management. Disaster management is one of the important functions of uh, civil servants. As we say that in India, you know, every natural disaster is always inevitably followed by man-made disasters. Why? Because one of the important activities of disaster management, response, has always been a failure. That is why we call it uh, in India, disaster management in India is called disaster of management. Disaster of management. Why? Because of uh, the bureaucracy. Bureaucracy with their with their status quo approach, neither have the skills nor knowledge nor commitment attitude to perform these functions. So the case study says that you are responsible for you know providing relief. Your team could not reach you because there because of the topography and everything else. Local people are stranded there for three four days. Obviously, you cannot expect them to behave like Mahatma Gandhi. They are extremely angry because nobody reached them. So when your team went there, you know, they started, uh, you, know, uh, you know, abusing you and one of your team members was also severely injured. Your team members do not want to, you know, continue with the rescue operations. What will you do under those circumstances? So here are two important issues. One is protecting your team members. That is, as the leader of the team, you have to take care of the safety and security of your team members. Second, again as a leader of the disaster relief team, you must provide immediate relief to victims also. You must provide immediate relief to the victims also. So you have to realize these two important objectives. Now what are the options in front of you here? What are the options in front of you? Only two options. One is call off 
the rescue operations. Second, continue with them. Your team members are demanding calling of rescue operations you know, because they are facing threat to their life. If you call off these rescue operations, what is the merit and what is the demerit? You will be able to protect the lives of your team members. You will be able to protect the lives of your team members. What is the demerit? Your actions are not either legal or moral. He cannot call off the operations. Why? Because, you know, as a civil servant, as a public servant, you must provide relief to the people. It is not moral also because everyone is looking for your team to provide relief. On the other hand, when you continue with the operations, what is the merit and what is the demerit when you continue with the operations? The merit here is that obviously you will be able to provide relief to the people their timely relief to the victims. The demerit here is that you will lose the confidence of your followers. They lose confidence in you. They believe that you are not able to, you are no longer able to protect the, their interests by forcing them to go there and work. By forcing them to go there and work, they lose confidence in your leadership abilities. So, if you look at both these options, this is what is called win-loss situation. What is called win-loss situation. So, you have to come out with a, a solution which is called a win-win situation. This is all ethics case studies are about coming out with a, this win-win solutions only. So, what will you do? What are you expected to do? What will you do? First of all, you know, you know, you have to think about providing safety and security to your team members. You know, you will request the local police to provide safety and security to your team members. You will request the local police to provide a you know, second emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. You will motivate. One of the important uh, aspects of emotional intelligence is motivation. You will motivate your team members to join the relief operations by explaining to them their duty towards the nation. Public servants, patriotism, service to the nation. You will motivate them. You say that uh, you know you must be willing to sacrifice. Give the example of army. You know, they are fighting near the borders. They are willing to sacrifice their life also. Here in this case, you know, some kind of injury should not prevent them because ultimately you have to serve the society. You will motivate them. Third, you know, what will you do? You know, you, what you have to do is that, you know, people are restless there. So what will you do? You will take the help of local political leaders, media, NGOs and civil society organizations as part of your rescue team. Why? Why? Because the local politician, you know, local politician, people know that person, local MLA or MP or anyone else, you know, he would be able to handle the people better. That is what we again say, emotional intelligence. He will be able to handle the people better. He can go and tell the people there that everything will be fine. The government is taking care of their interests. They will be getting all the timely relief you know, within a very short period of time. They must maintain peace and calm so that they can get the relief. Then you can take the local media also with you. Why? Because the media nowadays can influence the public opinion. Media should tell the people also how difficult it is for these rescue teams to go to the areas and uh, provide relief on a timely basis. And then uh, you take local NGOs and civil society organizations. Why? Because uh, this is what we study in disaster management. You know, the difference between uh, professional administrators, that is bureaucracy, and NGOs and civil society organizations is that these NGOs and civil society organizations, they work, uh, you, know, you know, with passion, you know, 
whereas for you it is profession as a leader of a disaster relief team it is in, it is your profession whereas ngos and civil service organizations it is their passion that is the reason why you know they do not mind you know facing any kind of challenges also service motive when you take them along with you they can also help you in uh, relief and uh, in a uh, rehabilitation operations and then uh, as i said uh, you will also be taking police with you so that uh, they can provide protection to your people in this manner as i said you are coming out with what is called win win solution win win solution wherein you are protecting your team members and at the same time also performing your functions as a, a relief uh, you know head of the relief team this is what you have to write examine the qualities of a public servant which will be required to manage the situation what are the qualities that are required as i said emotional intelligence you know motivational skills communication skills you know visionary skills the skills of uh, coordination you know then you require qualities like empathy you must be able to empathize with the problems of uh, so sufferings of the people and selflessness commitment to public service these are all the qualities that you are expected to have next uh, let us look at uh, other case studies honesty and uprightness are the hallmarks of a civil servant civil servants possessing these qualities are considered as a backbone of any strong organization in the line of duty they take various decisions at the time of uh, at uh, time some bona fide mistakes they commit some bona fide mistakes also as such uh, as long as such decisions are not taken intentionally and do not uh, benefit personally the officer cannot be uh, said to be guilty those such decisions may at times lead to unforeseen adverse consequences in the long term in the recent past a few instances have surfaced wherein the civil servants have been implicated for bona fide mistakes they have been often prosecuted even imprisoned these instances have greatly rattled the moral fiber of uh, uh, civil servants how does this trend affect the functioning of civil services what measures can be taken to ensure that honest civil servants are not implicated and for bona fide mistakes on their part justify the only thing is that i gave this question as part of section a they gave it as for case studies otherwise the same thing i gave the in section a i gave the question in two lines now they have so much of free time they gave it in 10 lines here you know, what is the problem here here you know, what is the problem here this question is about basically prevention of corruption act 1988 prevention of corruption act 1988 we are talking about the section 13 c and d you know those uh, who attend our ethics classes you know they know all these uh, things because i have done it in the classes i gave the same thing in the examination also so what is the problem here the problem here that is what we study in public administration also the problem here is that as a civil servant when you take a decision as a civil servant when you take a decision you do not know the outcome of the decision because as we study decisional outcomes are always related to future decisional outcomes are always related to future now if the decisional outcome turn out turn out to be wrong it turns out to be wrong then the government will punish you that is where you have institutions like cag cbi and courts it is said that as uh, the question says how does uh, this trend affect the functioning of civil services that is what we study we say that uh, in the last few years we have seen uh, policy paralysis in administration we have seen policy paralysis in administration because of these three c's cag cbi and courts you are taking a decision as a civil servant tomorrow the decision is wrong it has caused loss to the exchequer treasury of the government the government had lost the crores of rupees because of the decision that you have taken in the past immediately cag will find fault with you cbi starts inquiry 
and ultimately court will punish you. Why? Because you know the problem as I said with these sections in PCA, Prevention of Corruption Act. What is the problem here? You know, the problem here is about you know, differentiating between what is a bona fide mistake. Differentiate between what is a bona fide mistake and what is a crime committed with malafide intention. Differentiating between uh, with a crime committed with malafide intention. What is a bona fide mistake and what is a crime committed with malafide intention? Again, uh, you know, when you study about a CAG, the criticism against CAG is that CAG does not have the ability to differentiate between what is a bona fide mistake and what is a crime committed with malafide intention. That is the reason why CAG will find fault with every civil servant, you know, who commits a mistake, who commits a wrong. And as we study in administration, every civil servant has the right to commit honest mistakes. Every civil servant has the right to commit honest mistakes. Now, what is the trend that has been observed is that because of the inability of the CAG courts and the judiciary to differentiate between a bona fide mistake and a malafide crime, they are punishing even honest bureaucrats also. They are punishing honest bureaucrats also. When honest bureaucrats are punished like this, what is happening? Then the bureaucrats have stopped taking decisions. They are not taking any decisions. Why? Because whatever the decision they take today, they will be questioned by these organizations tomorrow. If you don't take any decision, there is no accountability. The moment you take any decision, you are made accountable. Which is resulting in what we call policy paralysis. Policy paralysis. Right? Then uh, once you know the problem, what is the solution? The solution was offered by PC Hotha Committee on Civil Services Reforms. PC Hotha Committee. As I keep on saying, whether you like it or not, for ethics paper, you need very good knowledge of public administration. Here, the 10th report of a second ERC on civil services should be the, should be Bhavad Gita or Bible or Quran for you for your ethics paper, along with a report on ethics in governance. All the questions are directly taken only from these reports. PC Hotha committee for the first time talked about this problem which was repeated by second ERC. What is the solution they have suggested? We must amend sections 13C and 13D of Prevention of Corruption Act 1988. We must amend these sections. What is the amendment? Here, the amendment is simple. Civil servants should not be punished for corruption in case you know, they commit any bona fide mistakes. They should not be punished for corruption. So what are we saying here? What we are saying here is that here, you are taking a decision, you are taking a decision which ultimately led to, you know, loss to, financial loss to the government, financial loss to the government. But the decision taken by you, it did not benefit you. You have not benefited out of the decision. That means you have not taken any bribes. It did not benefit your family members or friends or associates. He did not indulge in nepotism or favoritism. But it has caused financial damage to the government. For these kind of mistakes, 
you should not be punished. That is what the amendment section 13C and 13D. Why? Because why it has become controversial? Because why it has become controversial? Because in a H. C. Gupta, the coal secretary, who was very honest, he was sent to jail. He was sent to jail because of uh, allocation of coal mines. You know, he had given a suggestion to the prime minister, who was a uh, the, you know, coal minister also at that point of time, Manmohan Singh. And, uh, you know, he had given a suggestion that uh, the coal mines should be given to the private sector instead of uh, public sector enterprises. And it caused uh, financial damage to the government because uh, whenever public sector is there, preference should always be given to public sector. So, a case was filed against him and he was sent to jail. Even though he did not benefit by financially out of the decision. That is when, you know, recently the government uh, amended uh, this section 13.1 C and D of uh, Prevention of Corruption Act 1988. And what is the outcome? Immediately H.C. Gupta was released and the Supreme Court has, uh, you know, uh, has said that, has come out with the judgment that he was innocent. Why? Because he did not benefit out of the decision. He have, as a civil servant, the right to make honest mistakes. Otherwise, there cannot be any Governance. What is what is the meaning of the term governance? Governance means taking decisions and implementing those decisions. As a civil servant, you are expected to take decisions. Some of them can be right, some of them can be wrong. But that cannot stop you from taking decisions. That is what the question is about. Next, an apparel manufacturing company having large number of women employees was losing sales due to various factors. The company hired a reputed marketing executive who increased the volume of sales within a short span of time. However, some unconfirmed reports came up regarding his indulgence in a sexual harassment at workplace. After some time, a woman employee launched a formal complaint to the management against the marketing executive about sexually harassing her. Faced with the complaints, the company's indifference in not taking cognizance of her grievances, she lodged an FIR with police. Realizing the sensitivity and gravity of the situation, the company called uh, the woman employee to negotiate. In that, she was offered a hefty sum of money to withdraw the complaint and file F uh, and, uh, uh, the affair also, and also given writing that uh, our marketing executive is not involved in the case. Identify the ethical issues involved in the case. What options are available to the women employee? Again, unfortunately, the same question uh, I have given. You can see that uh, in, uh, in the next page, the last page, seventh question. Can you see that? A woman is sexually harassed by a top level senior executive in a large company. UPSC changed words to say that they have not copied. If she issues the company and during the settlement discussion she is often offered she is offered an extra, uh, extremely large amount of money. In the agreement she is required to confirm that the executive did nothing wrong. And after the agreement is signed the woman is prohibited from discussing anything in the public also. As I said both of us have taken the from same source. UPSC and uh, myself. You know, we can easily, because every year, one case study is all about women. Out of six case studies, reservations are there here also for women. Okay. Government may not be implementing 33% reservations for women in parliament, but they are definitely implementing reservations in UPSC case studies. And every year, the same case study they have to ask, sexual harassment at workplace. So, let us look at uh, what is the solution here. Identify, you know, again, if you look at, uh, you know, what are the issues of ethics, integrity and law posed in the case study. That is what I have given. Identify the ethical issues involved in the case. What are the uh, options available to the woman? The same thing. What are the options available to the woman? Employee. So, coming back here. So, what are the ethical issues? You know, the same case study, similar case study was asked three times in the last six years, similar case study. It was asked three times in the last six years. So what are the ethical issues involved here? First issue here is morality versus efficiency. Morality versus efficiency. Second ethical issue we are talking about here is, again, you go back to Immanuel Kant. 
using other people as instruments we are using other people as a means or instruments to satisfy our selfish ends to satisfy our selfish ends era third ethical issue involved here is dignity prestige honor respect and independence of women in our society what we call it as self esteem self esteem fourth issue here is you know fourth issue here is the instruments used by management the means or instruments used by management to buy silence of a woman to buy silence of a woman as the question says you know she lost fir and uh, the company called women employee it she was offered hefty sum of money to withdraw the complaint so that uh, they want to protect the marketing executive fifth ethical issue here is safety and security of women at a workplace safety and security of women at workplace sixth issue here we are talking about is we are talking about all the time more participation of women in development there are more participation of women in development we are also talking about uh, gender empowerment but the problem here is that our society which is parochial in nature is not willing to accept our society which is parochial in nature is not willing to accept women as equal partners in the development process it is not willing to accept women as equal partners seventh issue here is seventh issue here is that we are talking about here is a ethical issue that uh, we are talking about is a uh, the patriarchal mindset of uh, men in society patriarchal mindset of men in society who treat uh, patriarchal mindset of men in society who treat uh, women as who treat women as objects of pleasure who treat women as objects of pleasure so these are all the ethical issues we are talking about here then if you want you can write one more about corporate governance corporate governance is a what do we say we say that ethics of business is more important than business ethics all the things you will be studying in your ethics paper ethics of business is more important than business ethics business ethics only talk about profit maximization ethics of business talk about the means adopted to maximize profits also ethics of business is more important than business ethics now what options are available to the women employee what are the options available to her two options you know you don't have to worry about too many options two options one is accept the compensation withdraw the complaint and remain silent right accept the compensation withdraw the complaint and remain silent right accept the offer 
what is the merit and what is the demerit? The merit is that she is getting good amount of money. It can ensure her financial security. And it and it can also help her you know to get more promotions in the organization because she will be in the good books of their management. She will become a loyal employee. What is the demerit? What is the demerit? Her actions in a in a in this case are neither moral nor legal. Why legal, not legal? You know, according to law, you know, protection of women at workplace. If they face any kind of harassment, they have this fundamental right to approach judicial. You know, if you don't protect yourself, who will protect you? That is what. Second, reject the offer. What is the merit? If she is rejecting the offer, what is the merit? She has shown all qualities that are needed. Courage of conviction. Courage of conviction. And, uh, you know, perseverance. Which are needed. And she is willing to face the consequences also. She is also willing to face the consequences. She can be a role model for others by fighting her case by not coming under the pressure of uh, the top management. What is the demerit? She can be removed from the organization. She can lose her job also. So what should she do? She, do, she should always select the second option. So that once she is removed, she can start preparing for UPSC. <laughs> so no. You know, she should select the second option. Why? Because that is where you have to say, you know, this is what we study in ethics. If there is a fight between good and evil, if you remain silent, it means that you are siding yourself on the side of evil. And in this case, she was the victim also. She cannot remain silent. Today it happened to her. Tomorrow it can happen to anyone else. If she remains silent, it results in more degeneration. And if she remains silent, you know, other employees in the male employees in the organization, they also believe that it is their right to, you know, molest women in the organization. As long as they are efficient, the organization will protect them. Right? And that is what they are sending wrong kind of signals. Her actions are morally, legally, ethically are wrong. That is the reason why she should to fight. She should fight and she should get the justice so that she can become a role model for others also. That is what you have to write. And then what are the long term solutions? That is what we again we study in ethics. You know, every organization must implement uh, this uh, guidelines, Vishaka guidelines for the protection of women at workplaces. Next, come to the next question. In a modern democratic polity, there is a concept of political executive and permanent executive elected uh, era executive. Elected people's representatives from the political executive and bureaucracy from the permanent executive. Ministers frame policy decisions and bureaucrats educate them. In the initial days after independence, the relation between political executive and permanent executive were characterized by mutual understanding, respect and cooperation without encroaching upon each other's domain. However, in the subsequent decades, the situation has changed. There are instances of the political executive insisting upon the permanent executive to follow its agenda. Respect for an uh, appreciation of an operate bureaucrat has declined. There is an increasing tendency among the political executive to get involved in routine administrative matters uh, such as transfers, postings, etc. Under this scenario, there is a definitive trend towards the politicization of bureaucracy. The rising uh, materialism and acquaintance uh, 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 in social life has also severely impacted upon the ethical values of both permanent and uh, political executive. What are the consequences of uh, politicization of bureaucracy discuss? Again, uh, in, uh, this is straight away taken from uh, public administration. As I keep on saying, you know, those who have uh, good knowledge of public administration are the ones you know, who can do very well in ethics. 
as a, this is what we study in public administration you know what do we say we talk about a balanced polity max weber talked about what did he say there is clear cut division of work between political executive and permanent executive political executive responsible for policy formulation and uh, bureaucracy for implementation political executive must take into consideration values while formulating policies whereas bureaucracy must implement those policies strictly according to rules and regulations and uh, bureaucracy is expected to provide unbiased rational meritorious solutions to political executive and whereas political executive should not interfere in the in the in the functioning of bureaucracy that is what we say you know you know for this you know you have to read again second year se report on civil services one full chapter is devoted to this politician civil servant relationship and what we have said is that again if you remember in our, in our ethics or public administration classes we repeated the same thing what we have said is that in the initial days of our independence for the first two decades the political culture was dominated by values and bureaucratic culture was dominated by in a weberian norms it resulted in what is called balanced polity sadar vallabhai patel he said that i want my secretary to say no to what i say he is being paid to say no and not to say yes political executive expected bureaucracy to be completely impartial unbiased and meritorious in their decisions it required honesty and the courage of conviction on the part of political executive now but from 1967 onwards we have seen degeneration in our politics you know wherein political culture started dominated by emotions sentiments wherein the second generation of politicians entered into politics not to serve the society but to maximize their you know self interest as the question says and similarly you know bureaucracy also has changed the bureaucracy which was there during the colonial times had been replaced with a new set of you uh, know bureaucrats who are willing to you know sacrifice their independence impartiality and credibility for few positions within the government and the situation has completely deteriorated during uh, the time of indira gandhi when she had given a call for committed bureaucracy during emergency she felt that bureaucracy was not doing enough uh, to realize the objectives of her welfare state she wanted bureaucracy to be committed to the ideology of the ruling political party in power than to the ideals of the constitution which ultimately led to politicization of bureaucracy by 1990s as we studied you know it resulted in a complete politicization of civil services even at the state level also resulting in what we call unbalanced polity in the form of a politicization of civil services both bureaucracy and political executive joined hands together to exploit ordinary citizens and because we have colonial structures the exploitation had become much more easier because of you know complete secrecy in administration complete absence of accountability mechanisms and huge amount of discretionary powers in the hands of political executive and bureaucracy which resulted in crony capitalism annual nexus between political executive bureaucracy and businessmen and uh, what is the solution what is the solution we have said again the solutions you have to go to second erc report on civil services what are the solutions first and foremost what we have said is that the transfer postings promotions suspensions should not be in the hands of political executive that is what we called depoliticization of bureaucracy and it should be given to a central civil services board here you know, and this central civil services board consisting of senior most bureaucrats should decide on these matters strictly on the basis of what we call objective performance evaluation second year se recommended in a performance evaluation and the management systems which we call it as a 360 degree performance evaluation also this should become the basis of transfers promotions and everything another important recommendation that we have made or for that matter second year se has made is you know we must replace ex post accountability with ex ante accountability ex post accountability with ex ante accountability otherwise you know what is the situation 
it will result in complete degeneration of society due to this unholy nexus between political executive and bureaucracy which has already resulted in the failure of development administration because uh, that can be seen in the form of high levels of uh, corruption in our society and bureaucracy society and bureaucracy the bureaucrats are willing to dance to the tunes of their political masters for few positions within the government and we also suggested one more reform there should be better grievance redressal mechanism within the government in the form of uh, this administrative tribunals in the form of uh, vigilance commissions and vigilance cells they should take up the cases in a time bound manner and come out with uh, uh, you know solutions another solution as we have said is uh, this uh, prevention of corruption act amendments to pca all those things you have to write for this uh, question next uh, in uh, one of the districts of a frontier state narcotics uh, menace has become rampant what is the state punjab yes you know okay and you know if they had mentioned punjab at least that would have given them some kind of self esteem also out of 29 states in india upsc mentioned only our state they would feel good also they are not getting any credit for what they are doing sir coming back here this has resulted in money laundering mushrooming of poppy farming arms smuggling and near stalling of education the system is on the verge of collapse the situation has been further worsened by unconfirmed unconfirmed reports that the local politicians as well as some senior police officers are also providing the corruptious patronage to the drug mafia again punjab at that point of time a woman police officer known for her skills in handling such situations is appointed as a superintendent of police to bring your situation to normalcy if you were if you are the same police officer identify the various dimensions of the crisis based on your understanding suggest measures to deal with the crisis and if you are a man you have to undergo gender transformation because the question says that you are a woman police officer again upsc is discriminating against poor innocent men you know okay look at this two case studies only for women you know in a rampant reservations you know in upsc who will think about uh, the endangered species of men <laughs> so coming back here let us see you know if say, say that if you are the same police officer identify the various dimensions of the crisis what is the reason why you know we are facing this drug menace what are the reasons either you have to talk from all dimensions political dimension economic dimension administrative dimension social and cultural dimension from the dimension of a family you have to talk from all the dimensions either and of course all of them are interrelated so why people are taking to drugs those who have the experience you know and uh, they can come and uh, rescue me here because if i have to give answers to all these questions it should be it is based on only my theoretical knowledge not on the basis of any practical experience you know those who have the experience their time has come every dog has its day you know so why do people take to drugs pardon <laughs> internal peace <laughs> my god you know yes sir you know you know that is what experience <laughs> that is what experience is all about we think that there are so many other reasons we never thought that this can be the reason also so why do people take to drugs you know first in a society it starts as a fashion it starts as a fashion especially in the school level itself if you look at all these uh, you know uh, top uh, schools in our country top schools not in terms of education but in terms of uh, rich you know rich spoiled brats you know who are studying there they take up to drugs as a part of a what is called a fashion statement 
it starts from a childhood onwards. You know, if you are taking drugs, you feel that you, are a, you have become a superhero. You feel that you have arrived in the society. You have some kind of self-esteem. Second, you know, why do they take drugs? Peer pressure. You know, your friends are doing it. If you do not do it, you know, you will be treated, you know, differently in your group. Peer pressure. Third reason why, you know, you know, why the drugs, you know, what are the other reasons you think? Please remember, this question was asked in your internal security paper last year. The same questions, as I keep on saying, knowledge is the same. That is the reason why every year the UPSC keep on asking the same questions in different papers of your general studies. What are the other reasons why? You know, what are the other reasons why? You know, psychological states like depression. You want to get out of depression because it gives you artificial high, as he said, peace, <laughs> internal peace. Okay? So, you know, we, that is the, you know, advantage of having experienced people, you know. Okay. Next, fourth reason why? Availability. You will take it because they are available. Right? You know, fifth reason, psychological, you want to experiment. As we have said in one of the previous questions, an unexamined life is not worth living. <laughs> you have taken Socrates seriously. You want to examine. <laughs> you have taken Socrates seriously. You know, experimentation. Sixth reason why, you know, we have this drug menace. As we have said, you know, this unholy nexus between drug mafia, politicians, bureaucrats, and the police. Unholy nexus between drug mafia, politicians, bureaucrats, and police. Next, another reason why poor conviction rate, even if they are caught, they are released. Poor conviction rate. These drug landlords, drug lords, in a poor conviction rate, in a poor conviction rate by investigating agencies and judiciary. This is another, you know, next, you know, global links. The Dr. Max I have uh, global links. In India, we have what we, what do we call it as? This uh, golden, golden crescent, golden triangle. Yes. And of course, Policies of government also. Policies of government. For example, the government, you know, allows poppy cultivation. Why? The government wants us to believe innocently that it is needed for medicinal purposes. That is the policy of the government. Yes, in Assam and most part of the Northeast, it is allowed legally because the government is so innocent that it says that it is required for medicinal purposes. It takes place in India in a large scale, very large scale. Thousands of hectares of land is used for poppy cultivation. Unfortunately, this is what India is. Here, these are all the reasons. So, this is the various dimensions of the crisis. Again, another reason you can say is that this economic recession has created unemployment. It made people to find the solace in drugs, to find the comfort in drugs. They wanted to get out of uh, the difficult realities of life, economic crisis. And uh, interestingly, other thing also is responsible. Economic broom, boom also created this drug crisis. Why? Because thanks to this economic boom, especially in states like Himachal and Punjab, you know, people have huge amounts of money. They don't know how to spend the money. That is what Mahatma Gandhi called, you know, wealth without work. When you have so much of wealth without work, you don't know how to spend that money. That is the reason why 
again you take up to drugs you have to write all these dimensions political administrative economic social cultural psychological all these dimensions suggest should they may just deal with the should they may just deal with the crisis once you know the problem as is always say you know what the solution also so what are the measures to deal with this kind of crisis what should be done obviously when the problem is multi dimensional solution also has to be multi dimensional so as the question says you know imagine your yourself as the woman police officer imagine okay you know since neither you are a woman nor a police officer imagine you know <laughs> and uh, you know you don't know whether to laugh or cry you know with this kind of questions by upsc but again you know you cannot question them so coming back here imagine yourself as a police officer and what are the solutions that you will suggest first and foremost you know you know you talk about preventive measures then curative measures what are the preventive measures first identify the sources of this drug you know identify the sources of this drug second ban this poppy cultivation even for medicinal purposes also it is not required the government is deceiving itself when it says that you know government is allowing poppy cultivation only for medicinal purposes whereas 90% of it is only used for producing drugs the government is always under the misconception under the innocence that you know they are allowing poppy cultivation only for medicinal purposes do you know what are the places where this cultivation takes place on a large scale that is what always say general studies preparation is all about knowing about your country all aspects in the heart of the country also you know if it is northeast you don't mind in the heart of the country madhya pradesh chatisgarh maharashtra you know telangana in the forests thousands of hectares of land tribals as well as naxalites and if they are not doing it police will come and ask them to do it everything is done in the name of rule of law okay that is where the problem is so the second solution you will suggest is ban completely poppy cultivation third solution you know ensure strict punishment for those you know who are involved in this drug trade fourth solution the government must differentiate between suppliers and the consumers you know you cannot punish the all of them if you are a first time you know uh, you are a, if you are a first time uh, you know drug uh, involved if you are uh, for the first time involved in drug consumption you cannot be punished in the same manner as that of a supplier if you are keeping the drugs for your own consumption the punishment cannot be as severe as when you are a drug supplier you have to differentiate between the people the government has to look at those people who are consuming drugs with a much more in a more humane manner compared to those people who you know supply and produce these drugs it must ensure strict punishment for those people you know who are involved in production and supply whereas for those who are you know consuming them the government can have a lenient view of these things why because as we keep on saying every person has the right to commit mistakes we have to learn from our mistakes so let people commit mistakes first you know so that is what an unexamined life is not worth living so when are you starting when are you starting so so coming back here what are the other steps next one is creating awareness you know creating awareness among the people especially from childhood onwards and the government must ensure that these schools colleges are kept a close vigil so that the government will come to know about these consumption habits of people children there here you know, next what is the, the the government should also focus on drug rehabilitation centers you know that is what punjab state government is talking about now rehabilitation centers you know there is a film also you know what it is the title of the film ends with punjab you know yes so that is what you know that is the reason why even punjab state government also took you know very serious 
note of these things. You know, with those kind of films, you are only popularizing them. Right? So, you are, uh, you know, branding them as a, uh, you know, some section of society as a drug addiction. It is not true. Not everyone in Punjab takes drugs. At least one person don't take. <laughs> so, <laughs> coming back here. <laughs> so, that is what the focus should be on rehabilitation. You know, both the mental and physical aspects. That is what, uh, as a superintendent of police, you will also do. Next one is, you will break this nexus between politicians, police officers and bureaucrats. That is very, very important. Breaking the nexus. So, this is what, uh, you know, you will do, you know, as a solution to this uh, problem. You have to talk about all these things. As I said, from all dimensions, you know, you have to promote what is called, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, this family system. Why do people take to drugs when they feel alone, when they are depressed? That is when they take to drugs. They need that psychological support. That is why Punjab state government is talking about helplines. Whenever people are depressed, you call us. We make sure that you will become more depressed. Okay. Helplines. Okay, that is what. You know, similarly, you know, the government also is uh, including this, uh, you know, drugs in the academic curriculum from the childhood onwards to tell the people about uh, you know, the negative impact of uh, these drugs. So, it is said that uh, when the government recently banned uh, you know, these e-cigarettes, it can result in it can result in drugs. Now, e-cigarettes are not there, children will look for drugs. That is what they said. That is what we say, unintended consequences of public policies. Which one is uh, much more less harmful, e-cigarettes or drugs? Both of them are equal, you know, equally bad. Which one is relatively bad? So that is what, you know, you cannot expect people to be perfect human beings. You know, all of us, all the, all of them have weaknesses. So what the government has to do is that the government has to take proactive. There is what we study in ethics paper. You know, positive reinforces and negative reinforces. As what are negative reinforces, you are talking about, uh, in a conv in a ensuring conviction for people, coming out with strict laws, rules and regulations, ensuring better policing, you know, breaking the nexus. Positive reinforces means, uh, you know, having helplines and then rehabilitation centers and promoting uh, family values and ensuring that people do not become alone. That all the things that you have to write as part of this uh, question. Next, in recent times, there has been an increasing concern in India to develop effective civil services ethics, code of conduct, transparency measures, ethics and integrity systems and anti-corruption agencies. In this, uh, in view of this, there is need to, there is need being felt to focus on the three specific areas which are directly relevant to the problems of uh, internalizing integrity and ethics in civil services. These are as follows. Anticipating specific threats to ethical standards and integrity in uh, civil services. Strengthening ethical competence of civil servants. Developing administrative processes and practices which promote ethical values and integrity in civil services. Suggest uh, institutional measures to address the above three issues. Again, you know, it, this question requires practical knowledge of a public administration. The question looks uh, easy you know, on the face of it, but it may not be so easy. So, what the question says is that in the recent times, you know, in India, we are focusing more on what is called governance reforms. As part of this governance reforms, our focus is more on civil services reforms. Because governance reforms are possible only when there are reforms in the functioning of civil services. And the focus of the civil services reforms, as we keep on saying, is to ensure transparency, accountability, decentralization, participation. Transparency, accountability, decentralization and participation. To reduce corruption and so on and so forth. Now, you know, the question here is, how can we ensure these things in the functioning of our civil servants? The question says that, you know, there are three issues here you know, to realize these objectives, to ensure transparency, accountability, participation and uh, decentralization. There are three issues. One is 
anticipating specific threats to ethical standards and integrity anticipating specific threats to ethical standards and integrity in the civil services what do you mean by that what do you mean by that era when we know what it is we can easily come out with uh, solutions so what do you mean by anticipating specific threats to ethical standards and integrity in civil services so if i have to come out with any institutional reform i should know what are the threats to you know ethical standards and integrity in civil services what do you mean by that it means that what are the challenges related to probity in governance what are the challenges related to probity in governance you know what do you mean by that what are the challenges to ensure honest efficient transparent decentralized governance honest efficient transparent and decentralized governance so what are the challenges here first and foremost the challenge comes from the society itself the challenge comes from the society itself what is the challenge that is coming from the society when the societies are materialistic societies when societies are consumerist societies when societies give importance to only success when societies gives importance to only success is it possible for civil servants to be honest selfless empathetic and impartial in their functioning is it possible for civil servants to be honest selfless empathetic and impartial in their functioning is it possible for them to ensure what is called probity in governance is it possible no why because civil servants also come from the same society give the example here you know for example as a civil servant you have to implement laws rules and regulations related to dowry prohibition of dowry and the first thing you think about after getting into ias is how much dowry i will get that is what the first point talks about why because we are living in the same society wherein it is considered taking dowry is part of traditions and customs part of traditions and customs when you are living in that kind of society is it possible once you become a district collector to punish those people who are taking dowry is it possible then take other case you are coming from a society wherein women are always treated as a secondary grade citizens in the family as well as in the society tomorrow you become an ias officer and you are given the responsibility of implementing developmental schemes for women will you be able to do it with that kind of attitude that you have obviously not you will not be able to do it why because you are upbringing you know as i said in a this society our present society gives only importance to success it never gives importance to honesty it gives only importance to success but never to honesty so in those kind of societies if you are honest civil servant will you get any kind of will you get any kind of recognition in the society you are called useless civil servant because you don't know how to live that is what another problem second strengthening the ethical competence of civil servants under these circumstances the second thing is under these circumstances when you are facing so many challenges here how to strengthen the ethical competence of civil servants that means how to make civil servants honest selfless it you know all this selfless with love and compassion and also you know make sure that either they have a service motive also how can we ensure you know where in the society gives only importance to position power money and materialistic things how can we improve ethical competence of civil servants that is what the second point strengthening the ethical competence of civil servants how to make them ethical in their 
behavior as well as functioning. That is what the second thing you talk about. Third, developing a yes. You see, that is what you know. Both first and second, all of them are interrelated. The first part is about challenges. Second part is about changes. How to inculcate values. Third part. Developing administrative processes and processes which promote ethical values and integrity in civil services. That is what coming out with the structures, procedures and practices which promote these ethical values. Coming out with structures, practices and you know, uh, uh, processes which promote these ethical values. These three are the challenges. So, first one is, you know, the first challenge is, what are the specific threats to integrity? What are the specific threats to integrity? As we have said, we talked about what are specific threats? This materialistic societies, consumeristic societies, patriarchal societies, you know, wherein only success is given importance. People are, that is what we study in an ethics paper. What we say is that, what is the biggest change that has taken place after industrial revolution in terms of values? What is the biggest change that has taken place? You know, ends have become more important than means. That is what you have to write. The biggest challenge here is that, you know, in the materialistic societies, ends have become more important than means. That means the end, the ultimate objective of, uh, you know, becoming rich, retaining power, ensuring popularity you know retaining positions is much more important than the means you have adopted to realize those ends nobody looks at what are the means you have adopted as long as you are able to realize the objectives you know a businessman you know a successful businessman is called successful only when he earns huge amount of profits huge amount of wealth nobody looks at you know what are the means he has used Similarly, who do you call a successful politician? A politician who reaches positions of power and retains position for longer periods of time, irrespective of uh, the means he has adopted. The basic problem with our societies, as we study in our ethics paper, is in the present day societies, you know, goodness is equated to success. Whereas goodness is completely, has a different meaning in otherwise. When you say good businessman, when you say that Mukesh Ambani is a good businessman, it means he is a successful businessman. When you say that uh, Narendra Modi is a good uh, politician, it means that he is a successful politician. When you say that uh, you know, Sachin Tendulkar is a good cricketer, it does not mean that he is a good human being. He is a successful cricketer. That is the ba basic challenge you know, you know, in our present day societies. So once we know all the problems, what are the institutional measures that you can suggest? So, what are the measures that you can suggest? Again, this is what Second Yasi suggested in its report on ethics in governance. What are the measures? First and foremost, you know, what you have to do is that you have to implement multi-dimensional reforms in the society. You have to implement multi-dimensional reforms. Why? Because as we keep on saying, administrative system, that is what we study in public administration. Administrative system is a subsystem of the entire system, Fredericks. You know, so you cannot reform a bureaucracy unless you reform other systems. So the first thing is that you need to implement political reforms, economic reforms, governance reforms, social reforms, and financial reforms. You have to implement all these reforms so that these governance reforms, civil services reforms also can be successful as we have said these civil servants come from the same society you know you know in the society it is accepted norm that you know the more dowry you take the more successful you will be called in those circumstances can you expect a civil servant to be ethical in their behavior because they are influenced by the society so you have to reform the society reform the ethical system of societies reform political systems because at the end of the day the civil services reforms have to be implemented by politicians only only they have to take the decisions related to implementation of civil services reforms. Next, you know, you know, how to strengthen the ethical competence of civil servants. This is what again we study in ethics paper. You know, how to change attitudes, values and behaviors. 
you know first have role models have role models you know of those people who have become successful in true sense of the term success you know in true sense of the term success you know if you become cabinet secretary it does not mean that you are become successful if you are able to do well if you are able to do well for the people that is when you are called a successful civil servant first have right kind of role models so that you can improve their ethical competence second you know give them sensitivity training give them sensitivity training at present the training focuses only on structural and procedural aspects but not on behavioral aspects you know third you know to improve their ethical competence you know focus on value education moral education from the childhood onwards the basic problem with our education system is that it produces professionals but not human beings if you become if you are a good human being you will automatically become a good civil servant also focus on changing the in you know, a education system with you uh, know uh, more emphasis to values next coming back to developing administrative processes and practices which promote ethical values and integrity so what are the administrative processes and practices you are talking about cdn charters social audits rti right information outcome budgets cdn charters social audits rti outcome budgets e governance e governance then uh, empowering uh, local self governments by giving real powers to uh, in a local self government as part of 73rd 74th amendment next uh, changing uh, performance appraisal systems changing uh, performance uh, appraisal systems performance evaluation uh, systems at present how the performance is evaluated in civil services how it is evaluated it is evaluated in terms of their ability to implement the rules and the regulations not in terms of their ability to realize outcomes performance evaluated in terms of their ability to implement rules and regulations but not in terms of their ability to realize outcomes change performance evaluation systems here you know, performance evaluation systems next what are the other you know reforms depoliticize functioning of civil services depoliticize the functioning of civil services how can you depoliticize the functioning of civil services with uh, the recommendations we have given you know in the earlier question here you know, depoliticize the functioning of civil services next here you know, code of conduct and code of ethics what second yasi called it as public services code code of conduct and code of ethics what second yasi called it as a public services code so this is what uh, you have to write in this question paper as i keep on saying you know your ethics paper notes and uh, you know it is not about uh, talking about other things you can find almost each and every answer to every question in our class notes those who have attended they know these things our class notes is only around uh, i think uh, without case studies is around 70 80 pages and if you put it in printed format it is only 35 30 pages if you are reading anything beyond that it is criminal it is a criminal waste of time you can watch even shahrukh khan movies also to spend your time as i keep on saying this paper requires only one thing you should know what to study and it requires more of application and very good in depth knowledge of public administration very very important apart from our class notes you know what you can read is as i said two reports one is second class report on ethics in governance second one is 
civil services and two more uh, one or two more books also he can read vinod the roy former uh, cag vinod roy he had written a beautiful book called uh, not just an accountant wherein he talked about all the case studies which you see in a ethics paper not just an accountant very good book vinod roy wherein he talked about uh, the administrative uh, problems faced by civil servants vinod roy not just an accountant and uh, one more book which you can read is uh, mahatma gandhi's uh, autobiography you don't require guru charan das and all these people they are uh, at best stupid at worst idiotic okay you don't need to read all of them so mahatma gandhi's autobiography my experiments with the truth it will teach you about essence of life it will teach you all the civil services values at the end of the day as i told you it does not require more than 7 to 10 days of preparation you will definitely score above 150 marks easily easily or if you cannot read any of those things you can read our class notes nothing else and you will come to know about these things tomorrow when we discuss essay paper also tomorrow 11 o'clock we will discuss essays all those things